I welcome everyone to our workers training session tonight in Jesus name and I pray it will be a beneficial time for every one of us and the Lord by his word will chisel out whatever he needs to chisel out of our lives in Jesus name and the meeting will be a benefit to everyone Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight. We bless your name and glorify you. We thank you because you have chosen us. And you have chosen us to bear fruit. And that fruit bearing is because of faithfulness. Therefore, Lord, we pray you make us faithful so we can be fruitful in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray that all the gifts we need, all the grace we need, all the qualifying fruits that ought to be in our lives will be in the life of everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Perfect your work in us. Amen. Perfect your work through us. Amen. That Lord, when you've done the work of grace in our hearts, you'll use us too to do the work of grace in the lives of all the members, all the visitors and all the newcomers, everyone coming to our local churches in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray, Lord, in the house fellowship too, you will use us so that people in the house fellowship, uh, brothers, sisters, children, young people, will also move forward in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Open the scriptures to everyone today. I will pray, Lord, we'll move on, we'll, be, we'll progress in the things of the Lord, even as you reveal your might to everyone today. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. And the people of God said, Amen. Thank you very much. We are coming to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're reading from verses 1 and 2. 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're looking at verses 1 and 2. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. In verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, giving to hospitality, art to teach we'll study to verse 7 but we're limiting ourselves in the introduction to those two verses it talks about a bishop and he's talking to timothy speaking to timothy on how to select and who to select the qualification he'll be looking for when he selects the believers who are going to become elders leaders preachers pastors overseers in the ministry in the work of the lord the same thing he told titus in titus chapter one reading from verse seven in titus chapter one verse seven it says for a bishop must be blameless he mentions the bishop again by title the word bishop just means the overseer means the pastor Miss the elder and miss the leader over the congregation of the people of God. And then he uses the word must. This is compulsory. A person must be saved. A person must be sanctified. He must have the gift of God and the grace of God in his life. We must look for qualities as we're choosing believers to be in the ministry of the bishop, in the office of the bishop. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. You understand then when he says bishop, he's talking about the servant of God. He's talking about the steward of God. He's talking about somebody choosing to lead the people of God, lead sinners to salvation, and lead believers to maturity. A bishop, a steward of God, must not be self-willed, not sooner angry, not giving to wine, no striker, no fighter, and not giving to filthy lucre. That means it's not covetous, it doesn't have the love of money or the love of material things. It tells us in verse 8, it says, but it must be a lover of, of, of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, 
just, holy, and temperate. And then in verse 9, it says, Behold him past the faithful word. That is, he has learned the word. And that word is the faithful word. And God is faithful to that word. God is not going to change that word. As the Lord Jesus Christ was faithful to the word of God, faithful to the will of God, and faithful to the message the Father had given unto him. So the one who is going to be a leader, an elder, and who is going to be a shepherd over the people of God must also have the faithfulness to keep on holding fast, holding forth the word of life as he has been taught. What you heard before you were saved, what you were taught that led you to repentance, that led you to salvation as you have been taught. What you heard that led you to consecration and to commitment and to make your life an instrument in bringing other people to the Lord. What you learned that benefited you, the same you will pass on as he has been taught. What has made you faithful, what has made you fruitful and what has made you focused on the work of God without any distraction. That same word you hold forth as you are being taught that he may be able by sound doctrine not by storytelling, by sound doctrine, not by entertainment, by sound doctrine, not by political review, by sound doctrine. What we preach in the, in the congregation, what we reveal to the people of God that will get sinners convicted and saved, that will make sinners confess their sins and call upon the Lord and seek the face of the Lord until they are saved. It will be sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is the word that is healthy, the word that is sound, the word that is scriptural, that shows the sinner the way out of sin into salvation, that shows the believer the way out of self into sanctification, that shows the sanctified, purified believer the way out of powerlessness into the power of the Holy Ghost. Sound, steadfast, healthy, solid, stable doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers there might be people who will argue there might be people who will give say there might be people who will oppose but the one who is going to be a bishop a leader an elder a pastor a teacher of the word of god must be somebody who is able to speak convincingly persuasively so that opposers will see the light and they will leave their opposition and they will come to the light it says in uh, first uh, first peter chapter 2 reading from verse 25 first peter chapter 2 verse 25 for ye were a sheep going astray but are now returned unto the shepherd look at the word and the bishop of your souls it is referring to the lord jesus christ his savior is referring to the lord jesus christ is the shepherd is lord but now peculiarly jesus christ is the bishop of our souls the bishop and the shepherd the same the bishop and the overseer the same the bishop and the protector of the sheep of the fold of god the same the bishop of your souls as we look at this first timothy chapter 3 tonight verses 1 to 7 we're looking at the calling and commission of believers with bishops the bishops have a calling the believers too have a calling and we're making a comparison and we're also making and we're looking at the believer we're looking at the bishop and as we look at them together we look at the bishop and we look at the believer why are we doing that there are people that have the understanding if you are going to be a bishop then you have all these qualifications and then when you become a bishop you are working on that so that the qualification of the bishop will be in your life not really you understand what the lord is telling us from the epistle of paul to timothy 
the believers are going to be chosen and selected to be bishops and those believers must have these qualifications in their lives before you choose them to be bishops it is not that you choose them first the bishops first after that you are not looking for the qualification or the qualifying marks they have those qualifications they have those characteristics they have those marks of the believer a true believer and because they have that that's why now they are being chosen to become bishops as we look at the message today the calling and the commission of believers were bishops there are three perspectives we're looking at number one the comparison between believers and bishops among saints the saints are the believers out of those saints you choose servants you're not choosing the servants of god or the stewards of god from among sinners you're choosing the servants of god the stewards of god the bishop that are going to oversee the affairs of those souls you're choosing them from among the believers and among the saints that's why we want to consider the qualification of the bishops and the characteristics of the believers number two the commission for believers from the bishop of our souls already we have seen from first peter chapter 2 verse 25 that jesus christ our lord our savior our redeemer is the bishop of our souls and the bishop of our souls has given believers commission so we're looking at point number two the commission for believers from the bishop of our souls number three the conformity of the believer to the bishop of the sheep that is christ the bishop of the sheep expects that the believer the church of god will live in conformity to the life to the ministry and to the manifestation of the grace and the gift of god coming from uh, the bishop our conformity as be as the believers to the bishop of the sheep let's look at number one in number one we're looking at the comparison between believers and bishops among saints as we read first timothy chapter 3 from verse 1 to verse 7 you're going to see 16 distinctive characteristics that bishops must have look at verse 1 this is a true saying if a man desire the office of a bishop he desireth a good work the office of a worker a good work the office of a full-time worker a good work you couldn't do any other work better than that in your life as a man of god as a woman of god and the office of a pastor of a preacher of a shepherd of an overseer a good work a good work that transcends your existence here on earth all the other work we do they're very good very good but good only for the earth so as to keep soul and, and body together all the work we do here on earth is so as to be able to build a house have shelter roof on our heads and to be able to have clothes have something to cover ourselves be able to eat have something to feed our body but at the point of death all that is over but the work of god the work of the steward and the work of the servant and the work of the preacher the work of the bishop is so good it goes beyond the earth that will receive reward in heaven what are the things we know about the bishop then look at verse 2 in verse 2 a bishop then must be blameless but understand that blamelessness is not only in a bishop is also in the believer you cannot say well i'm not a bishop so if i'm not blameless no problem that's a problem a believer too must be blameless look at philippians chapter 2 reading from verse 14 
in Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 do all things without murmurings and disputes in verse 15 it says that ye may be blameless those are believers those are believers you as a believer myself as a believer we become believers before we become bishops and that blamelessness must be seen in our lives in the home in your family in your office in the place of work in your community you must not be a person that is blameworthy people are saying this about you saying that about you and you say well i don't care after all i'm not a bishop a believer must be blameless and harmless the sons of god without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world that is in the corrupt world in the polluted world in which we are a believer must be blameless if you are not blameless as a believer go back to calvary and let the blood of jesus cleanse you and wash you and then purge you and all the blame and all the blemish will get out of your life calvary makes a difference in our heart in our spirit in our life that it makes the believer blameless as you think about uh, the as you think about the bishop it says number two a bishop must be a man of one wife well as uh, somebody cannot say i'm not a bishop and therefore i don't have to keep to one wife you know what it says in first corinthians chapter 7 verse 2 and he's talking to all believers not only bishops nevertheless to avoid fornication let every man every man not just a bishop a believer too let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband faithfulness in the family faithfulness to your wife is not just because well i'm a pastor if i were not a pastor i would have done this i may be i'm a bishop if i were not a bishop i would have gone into that no you cannot if you did that as a believer you backslide if you die in that condition god will not say because you are not a bishop that's why you did that mercy thing you will perish and so to remain a believer that is not backsliding you are a man of one wife and then it says a bishop must be blameless husband of one wife the next word there says vigilant you are vigilant is it only the bishop that will be vigilant look at first peter chapter 5 we're looking at verse 8 in first peter chapter 5 verse 8 it says be sober believer be vigilant believer because your adversary the devil as a running lion walketh about seeking in whom he may devour and then it says in verse 9 whom receives steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world in your brethren as a believer you must be vigilant jesus spoke to everyone he says be watchful and pray watch and pray that you fall not into temptation being vigilant is for everyone and then the next word there is sober we're called to sobriety you cannot say well i'm flippant because i'm not a bishop I'm frivolous because I'm not a bishop. I'm a joker because I'm not a bishop. And I just, I'm light. And I make the society, I make them laugh. And then I'm not serious because, you know, I don't have the seriousness of a bishop. I don't have the ambition to be a bishop. I'm just a believer. A believer must also be sober. It tells us in Titus chapter 2, reading from verse Verse 11 it says for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men then verse 12 says teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lost we all of us believers should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world and then it goes on in first timothy chapter 3 telling us in verse 2 here it says he must be of good behavior 
of good behavior. You see, to let be a bishop that will be of good behavior, and then somebody says, I'm just a believer and just a member of the church, and therefore I, I misbehave between boys and girls. I misbehave unto those uh, minors, that is, uh, young girls and young ladies. I misbehave after all, I'm just a believer. A believer must be of good behavior. You remember in First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it says, It does not behave itself unseemly. That's a believer. It does not behave himself in a way that people will say, But you say you are a Christian, but you say you are a believer. Are you acting like this? Are you behaving like this? How is it you are not trustworthy? How is it your, your behavior is not above reproach? He behaves himself in an orderly manner. He seeketh not a owner. He's not easily provoked. He seeketh no evil. And then he says he must be hospitable. Hospitable. That means he's friendly. That means he's a giving person. That means he's a helpful person. That means if he sees people in need, he's ministering to their needs. A bishop must be hospitable. How about a believer? In Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 13. Romans chapter 12, verse 13, is talking to all, all believers of all categories, all believers, from the young believer to the growing believers and to the maturing believers and to the matured believers, everyone called believers, it says distributing to the necessity of saints, giving to hospitality, giving to hospitality. And then he tells us, he says, he must be apt to teach. That word apt is having aptitude to teach. Aptitude to teach. That's a very simple saying. We communicate. We talk to other people. When you see uh, young people at home, they are talking to their siblings. And whatever information they want to pass across, they have the aptitude to pass that on. When we, as we're going to school, between our classmates, we don't seek, we don't say, I'm, I'm not an orator, I'm not a good speaker. Anything you want to tell your classmates, but when there's no threats, when there is uh, uh, no difficulty or distraction, you talk freely to your, uh, to your classmates and you talk and you spoke convincingly and persuasively. If you were selling in the market, just non-ordinary something, uh, you're able to convince the people you want to sell to, you are at to, uh, to teach and you are asked to discuss and to tell them and convince them uh, as to what you want to sell to them. That same quality is in the life of a child of God, in the life of the believer, asked to teach. Look at Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's talking to all believers. And then it says, teaching and admonishing one another. Teaching and admonishing one another. So if you're a believer, you, are, you can share your testimony convincingly. If you're a believer, you can you read something in the devotion in the morning. You can say, my friend, you know i discovered something in the word of god this morning it ministered to me this way let me pass it across to you it's for all believers that were teaching and were admonishing one another in the psalms and the hymns and spiritual songs and singing with grace in your heart to the lord as we look at the bishop it says the bishop is not giving to wine not giving to wine but it's certainly for bishops you find somebody you catch somebody is taking alcohol and is drinking and drinking uh, until he becomes a uh, drunk and then when he comes out of his drunkenness you say i'm surprised something happened in your life that you give yourself to wine to alcohol and then you are talking rubbish 
Paul is said is that so? Yeah, but, well, but you know I'm not a bishop. I, I've read the Bible that says a bishop must not be given to wine. But he has not read in Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 18. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, be not drunk with wine. All believers, a real child of God, you have that self-control, you have that self-denial. If alcohol was your problem before you were born again, now you are born again. And because you are born again now, the Spirit of God controls you and you are in control of what you take, you are in control of what you drink. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then it says that the bishop is no striker. It's not somebody who solves his problem by the feast of the hand. It's not a person that will strike another one, blow another one, punch another one. It's not pugnacious. He doesn't have a fighting character, a violent character. He has got the spirit of Christ. Is meek and lowly and gentle, and because of that, even though he's not a bishop, even though he's not a worker, even though he's not a pastor, he will not be a striker. Look at the word of God, it tells us in uh, Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Believer, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Don't allow argument to come. Don't allow anger to come. Don't allow violence in your life. If you're a person that has been given to violence and you have been given to fighting, if you're a person that habitually in the past fighting violence striking and smiting all that was your manner of life any little sin you are provoked any little sin you get angry any little sin you're speaking out and you're speaking so much loud that people are saying cool now now what's the matter what has happened he said just because of this just because of that you're flaring up now oh he says you know i mean believer but uh, well thank god i'm not a pastor yet thank god i'm not a bishop yet as a child of god bishop or no bishop you are a believer let nothing be done through strife or in glory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves actually fighting erupts because you see I'm higher than him, I'm higher than her, and why doesn't he recognize I'm greater than him, higher than him? And because of that pride, when people will not agree with your evaluation of yourself, that's why the pride comes. And that's why the pride generates the striking and the smiting and the violence and the fighting. But as a child of God, let others esteem others better than themselves. It says in verse 4, in verse 4, look not every man on his own things. You know what brings strife? You're looking on your own thing. What I prefer what I want, what I desire, the honor that should be given to me, the recognition that should be given to me. And when people do not give uh, that kind of honor you're expecting, uh, that's how anger comes. But if you're not looking at what you want, what you desire, what you prefer, if you're looking at what will please the other one, what will encourage the other one, what will lift up the other one, You'll never be angry and you'll never fight. It says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things, on the advantage of others. In verse 5, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. When we have the mind of Christ, there will be no strife. 
if we're getting angry, you catch yourself getting angry at any sin. You don't have the mind of Christ the way you ought to have. If you find yourself fighting, you're violent, and you're smiting other people, and you want to correct a child, you're angry, and then you say words, and you're shivering, you're, you're shaking for anger, it's because you don't have the mind of Christ. If there is anything stirring you up, I'll do this, I'll do that, and you want to hurt your fellow brother, your fellow sister, or hurt somebody who is lower than you are, in position or privilege the reason is you don't have the might of christ in you and understand the people who are going to go with the lord when he comes are the people that have the might of christ the nature of christ and the characteristics of christ in them and so if you don't have that mind of christ and you are always in the attitude of wanting to fight go back to calvary and let the lord jesus christ deal with that sin in your inner mind so that you have the might of christ in you let this might be in you which was also in christ jesus and then it talks about the fact that we're not greedy the man of god the minister of god the steward of god the servant of god is not greedy is not covetous uh, look at first timothy chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 6 first timothy chapter 6 reading from verse 6 but godliness with contentment is great gain that's for believers believers the saints of god the children of god the ministers of god the stewards of god everyone in the household of faith godliness with contentment is great gain in verse 7 it says for we brought nothing into this world that's for all believers that's for every one of us that's for the bishop too we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can carry nothing out and then in verse 8 it says and having food and raiment let us be there with content it tells us about the about the bishop that he must be patient he must be patient and as we look at first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 14 first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 14 now we exhort you brethren all believers not only bishop one them that are unruly comfort the feeble-minded support the weak be patient towards all men be patient towards all men and then he tells us it's not a brawler that's the bishop the uh, the bishop is not a brawler it's not somebody who wants to shout other people down it's not somebody from the pulpit from the stand where he's preaching he's looking at something over there he sees something over there and that thing irritates him and that thing stirs him up and that thing makes him angry and then he boils from within and then is a brawler for bishop he cannot be like that he should not be like that if he has that kind of temper he needs to go back to calvary because that temper disqualifies him, disqualifies her for ministering to the sheep and to the lamb. If that happens in the life of a bishop, he ought to check himself, what's happening to me? Who do you think I am? And how am I carrying on the ministry? But it's not just for the, pre for the preacher or for the bishop. It's also for the believer. That the believer must not be a brother. And look at Titus chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 1. Titus chapter 3 verse 1. Put them in mind. Put them, all of them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to be magistrates and to be ready for every good work. Then in verse 2, in verse 2, to speak evil of no man. Look at this, to be no brothers. 
believers to be no brothers but gentle showing all meekness all kinds of meekness all types of meekness unto all men and now he must not be covetous a bishop as we're told in those qualifications must not be covetous but how about believers look at um, Ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse 5 Ephesians chapter 5 verse 5 for this you know for this you ought to know for this if you're a conscientious believer a believer that wants to get to heaven a believer that wants to please the Lord this ye know that no monger, no unclean person, no covetous man, he cannot give an excuse. I'm covetous because after all, I'm not a bishop. If you're a believer, you must understand and you must know this for certain that no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. In verse 6, it says in verse 6, let no man deceive you and let no man deceive himself with vain words for because of these things because of covetousness and all the other things because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience not only that he rules his own house well we're told in first Timothy that chapter 3 that a bishop is one that rules his own house well and they were told for if he knows not how to rule how to control how to oversee how to provide for his own house how shall he be a leader in the house of God ruling his own house well look at Ephesians chapter 6 and this is for all believers Ephesians chapter 6 and we're looking at verse 4 and ye fathers believing fathers and ye fathers children of God who are fathers and ye fathers members of the kingdom of God who are fathers provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord that's for mothers too and ye mothers provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord is for all parents your parents you have child you have children you have to rule your house well you have to provide for your house very well bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and then it says is not lifted up with pride not a novice less being lifted up with pride it falls into the condemnation of the devil we must not be proud that's for all people by the way in James chapter 4 reading from verse 6 James chapter 4 verse 6 but he giveth more grace wherefore he says God resisteth the proud but giveth grace to the humble giveth grace to the humble in verse 7 it says submit yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he will flee from you look at verse 10 in verse 10 it says humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up and then we're told he must have a good report of those that are without he must have a good report of people in the community and people in the marketplace and people in the office and people in the neighborhood he must have a good report how about a child of god how about a believer every believer must make sure that the way he lives in the community and the way he lives with the neighborhood he too has a good report look at third john chapter one third john chapter one reading from verse 11. third john chapter one verse 11 beloved follow not that which is evil but that which is good that which is good he that doeth good is of god 
but he that doeth evil has not seen God. He that doeth evil cannot say, well, I'm a believer, but not a bishop. No, he that doeth evil has not seen God. If you have seen God as your father in salvation, in redemption, in forgiveness, if the grace of God come into your life and appearing to you with salvation experience, you'll not do evil. It tells us in verse 12, it says, Demetrius hath good report. You can put your name there. You're born again. You're a believer. You have good report of all men, of all men, of all the people who know you, of all the people who interact with you, of all the people who do business with you, you have a good report of all men and of the truth itself. And we also bear record, and you know that our record is true. Well, we've made a comparison between the bishop and the believer, the believer and the bishop, and we should show the characteristics and the marks and the character and the behavior and the grace of the bishop in the life of the believer as well. Let's come to point number two now. Point number two, the commission for believers from the bishop of our souls. From the bishop of our souls. In Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 18. Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 18. Jesus came, the bishop of our souls came, the Lord came, and the shepherd, the good shepherd that gave his life for the sheep, he, Jesus, came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth and then in verse 19 go ye therefore that's the commission to all believers that's the commission to all bishops that's the commission to all pastors that's the commission to all evangelists that's the commission to all soul winners that's the commission to all members of the body of christ go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost verse 20 teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and lo, i am with you always it's not only with the bishop i'm with you always it's not only with the evangelist i'm with you always it's not only with the pastor teacher i'm with you always it's with all the believers he gave this promise to all believers as he gave the commission to all believers behold lo i am with you always even to the end of the world and the whole church said yeah. three things we're looking at number one the believers calling to learn and labor for the savior the believers calling to learn and labor for the savior look at matthew chapter 11. in matthew chapter 11 we're looking at verse 29 it says take my yoke upon you believer take my yoke upon you child of god take my yoke upon you saint of god take my yoke upon you servant of god steward of god everyone take my yoke upon you and learn of me for i am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your souls in verse 30 for my yoke is easy and my body is light he wants us to learn of him he wants us to labor for him in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 14 second corinthians chapter 5 we're reading from verse 14 for the love of christ constraineth us for with us judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. 
Look at verse 15. It says that he died for all, that they which live should henceforth not live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. We ought to live for the Lord. We learn and we live for the Savior. Number two. In number two, the believer's commission to lead the lost to salvation. That's a commission for the bishop, for the pastor, for the evangelist, for the teacher of the word of God, and to every believer. We have the commission to lead the lost to salvation. It also seen uh, Luke chapter 19 verse 10 Luke chapter 19 verse 10 for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost that was his calling that's why the father sent him that was his ministry and that's the same mandate has given to all believers as it says in verse 13 verse 13 and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them occupy till I come occupy till I come he wants us to be occupied in leading the lost to salvation look at number three there number three the believers consecration to live and lose all of self the believers consecration to live and lose all of self we're told in John chapter 3 verse 30 he must increase, but I must decrease. What does that mean? When John said, when John the Baptist said, he must increase, but I must decrease. Did he mean he must increase in the physical stature, in his body mass, BMI? He must increase in his flesh, it must increase in the physical height and then I must decrease my height must decrease my body mass must decrease no not at all he must increase in glory I must decrease in glory he must increase in honor I must decrease in honor it must increase in exaltation i must decrease in uh, exaltation it must increase in uh, the eyes of the people its honor its glory its ministry its messiahship is the knowledge of him its recognition he must increase but i must decrease John the Baptist was saying, I'm not competing with Christ. I'm not competing with the Messiah. I'm not competing with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. I must decrease. I must stay behind. And people will see less of me and see more of him. If you are a true believer and if you're a true pastor, a true preacher of the word of God your stature is not so big that you block out the Lord Jesus Christ they can see you but they cannot see the Lord again what a great preacher and what a small savior what a great orator but what a little redeemer he does not understand that he must not stand between the sinner and the Lord. 
he must not stand between the sinner and the savior you must get out of the way and let the sinner see the fullness of the redemption of christ let the sinner see the fullness of the perfection of the sacrifice let the sinner see the height and the honor and the exaltation of the redeemer who can redeem them but you know there are people in ministry there are people who say they are believers and their image is so large their honor is so large their exaggeration of themselves is so great that you can barely see the savior they're talking about he the lord must increase but i must decrease in john chapter 12 reading from verse 24 john chapter 12 verse 24 verily verily i say unto you except a corn of which fall into the ground and die it abides alone but if it die it bringeth forth fruit if you're too conscious of yourself if you're too occupied with yourself and if you're building up your self-esteem every time if it is all of self but none of him or if it is some of self but some of him or if it is a little of self but much more of him you will not be able to bring sinners to the Lord as long as you want to occupy the center stage and you do not allow self to die you will not be a person that promotes Christ his glory his grace his honor his salvation and his sacrifice for the children of men except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it abides alone but if it die when self dies then it brings forth much fruit and that's why you need to understand that this is the calling that the lord has given us let self die you have heard before the words of this song with the bitter shame and sorrow that a time could ever be in my life as a person professing that I'm a believer or maybe even as a pastor when I let the Savior's pity plead in vain and proudly I said proudly I answered all of self and none of thee can you profess to be sanctified when self is at the center of the stage and when self is sitting on the throne of your heart and everything must revolve around you we must respect you we must recognize you we must honor you and it is not enough for us to honor christ exalt christ we must remember and recognize your position self is fighting for recognition every time the believer's consecration is to leave all of self and lose all of self yet he found me and i beheld him pleading on their cursed tree i heard him pray father forgive them and my wishful heart said faintly some of self and some of thee there are many people they live their lives as if okay self shift a little let the lord also see it by your side self is there pride is there self-esteem is there self-promotion is there i talk about christ i talk about self 
I talk about the Savior. I talk about self. I lift up the Savior. I don't forget to lift up myself. Self must be known. Self must be recognized. My achievement, my knowledge, my skill, my ability, everything must be recognized. Yes, I'm going to talk about the Savior, but the but self must still be part of the deal. You know what the Lord is saying? The Lord is saying you are not consecrated unto him. When self is still competing with him, Santa 36, day by day, is tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, sweet and strong. And I, so patient, brought me lower while I whispered, okay, self, less of self and more of thee. All right now, Lord, can we make a bargain? Out of 100, I'll give you 60% and I'll take 40% to myself of my time, of my treasure, of my skill, of my position, of my popularity. I yield a little and I give you a little. I give you even 70%. But you must not expect, Lord, that I'm going to give you all the 100%. And then the Lord is saying, what if I gave you only 60% of redemption and I withheld the 40% uh, of redemption remaining? What if I give you the 70% of my ability of everything I did and of my blood that I shed and I told the Father only 70% of the benefit of my blood for him I withhold the 30%, what if I give you only 80% of the possibility of me, which means now as I go out, Lord, I don't want anything to see anything of me. I'm not hanging my certificate on the hem of my jacket. I'm not hanging my qualities and qualifications at the wrist of my hand. I'm not looking for, don't you know me? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know my position, my power, my authority? All that is gone because except a wheat of corn, a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, not faint and die, not partially and die completely, falling to the ground and is buried out of sight unless that happens he abides alone but if he die and is buried and is forgotten then resurrection life will come and it will bring forth much fruit i pray you'll bring forth much fruit Amen. all of us will bring forth much fruit in jesus name but the question is, when are you going to forget yourself in remembrance, in preference of Christ? When are you going to forget your stature and your honor and your exaltation and your position and your attainment and your achievement and your name and the name of your family and all that you have been cherishing when is that going to die when are you going to come to the believers consecration forget yourself and leave all and lose all of self let's come to point number three now in point number three we're looking at our conformity as believers to the bishop of the sheep remember the bishop of the sheep that's the lord jesus christ and we're to be conformed unto him we're coming to first peter chapter 2 verse 25 first peter chapter 2 verse 25 for ye were a sheep going astray ye were ye were you are no more going astray to false doctrine you are no more going astray to false prophets you are no more going astray uh, to false notion you are no more going astray after the deception of the antichrist you were in the past you were a sheep going astray 
but are now returned you have returned I have returned we have all returned in Jesus name the prodigal son is back home he'll never go back to the far country the prodigal daughter is back home she'll never go back to the far country the backslider is restored and returned he'll never go back to the forest and the wilderness of sin anymore in jesus name but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls look at verse 21 in verse 21 now that we have returned to the bishop to the shepherd of our souls even here unto were ye called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps that ye should follow his steps our conformity as believers to the bishop of the sheep number one the passion of the believer like that of his bishop he is a bishop and we have the passion of the believer as like that of the bishop look at john chapter 2 verse 17 in john chapter 2 verse 17 and his disciples remembered that it was written the zeal of thine house has eaten me up that means the zeal of thine house has consumed me the zeal of thine house has fired me up the zeal of thine house has burnt every chaff out of my life that was said of christ that must be said of the christian that was said of the bishop of the sheep that must be said of the believer saved by the lord the zeal of thine house has eaten me up the believers remembered when they saw something he came to the temple he came to the house of god he came to the sanctuary and he saw what should not be in the sanctuary and he acted is the action that made them to remember it was written concerning him the zeal of thine house has eaten me up when you come to the house of god what you see if you see corruption do you act if you see compromise do you act if you see sinfulness do you act if you see infidelity if you see unbelief if you see defilement do you act or are you used to that now well the world is the way the world is and even though the church is church but the world has come into the church and if you act in any um, zealous way they say what's the matter with you what are you doing and why don't you understand that that's what happens today and that's what must be happening uh, every time but if you are like christ and christ has brought you into the kingdom the same character of christ the same mind of christ the same disposition of Christ and the same attribute in Christ, that same mind, that same disposition, that same character must be in you. That the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. As you go in the society and you see sin unabated, sin unchecked, 
sin uncontrolled and everybody just does whatever they will do even those who carry church on their head even those who are religious how do you do what will Christ have done Christ will act Christ will speak Christ will warn Christ will call them to repentance and Christ will tell the sinners when they will spend eternity if there is no conviction if there is no conversion if there's no salvation if there's no transformation that's because the zeal of the house of the Lord had eaten him up the believer must have that same passion that same zeal when you see people living in sin you must be able you must be willing to give your life for their salvation able willing to give your life for jolting them for alerting them for quickening them for waking them up and for making them to realize that the way of the sinner the way of the righteous is hard and if they die in that condition they will spend eternity in hellfire it must be said of you he cannot bear to look at sin and sinners and keep his cool he cannot bear to see corruption and compromise and keep level-headed he cannot see evil and defilement anywhere in the young or in the old and then just go as usual as if nothing strange is happening the character of christ and the commitment of christ and the passion of christ and the zeal of christ you will discover in him and you'll be able to say of him by his attitude by his action by his preaching by his admonition by everything he does even by standing and by his appearance you'll be able to say about him the zeal of thine house has eaten me up look at john chapter 9 reading from verse 4 john chapter 9 reading from verse 4 i must work that's the zeal that's the passion of the lord i must work the works of him that sent me while it is day the night cometh when no man can walk look at verse 5 in verse 5 as long as i am in the world i am the light of the world as long as i am in the world i am the light of the world that means until he went to the cross he was still bearing witness unto the truth and then while he was still there on the cross there was a thief on the cross saying lord remember me when you come to your kingdom as long as i am in the world the work of salvation must go on i am the light of the world i say unto you today thou shalt be with me in paradise and while you're still in the world maybe you are physically weak as long as you can speak as long as you can connect with another person as long as you can touch a neighbor as long as you can reveal anything read the bible to anyone as long as you are still existing and still living in the world you must be, be the light of the world and you let your light so shine that people may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven i pray that same zeal of christ the lord will impart to every one of us in jesus name Amen. number two we're looking at the prayer of the believer like that of our bishop the prayer of the believer like that of our bishop look at luke chapter 22 in luke chapter 22 we're reading from verse 44 luke chapter 22 reading from verse 44 it tells us in verse 44 that jesus christ prayed and as he prayed the sweat that came from him was like great drops of blood 
You know, many people are used to quiet prayer, silent prayer, easy prayer, and effortless prayer, the kind of prayer that does not bring any kind of passion, any kind of importunity, that does not bring any, any kind of kneeling themselves to the cross of Christ, saying, not my will, but thine be done, as we are believers in the Lord. And we'll see how Jesus Christ prayed, and he wanted the will of the Father. He wanted that to be done above his own will. Our prayer, like the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ, must be that the sinners will be saved, that those who are saved will be sanctified. Our prayer must be that we are asking the Father that he will baptize the sanctified believers with the Holy Ghost. Our prayer must be like that of Jesus interceding for the believers. But he preached earnestly in Luke chapter 22 reading from verse 44 and being in an agony being in an agony are you ever in agony because of sinners who are careless because of sinners who are nonchalant and because of so-called believers who do not regard the word of God and because of people who say they believe in the Lord and they're superficial are you ever in agony because of believers who see all the promises of God and they do not know how to claim the promises of God does it bring agony in your heart as a believer when you see other children of God and they're living like orphans and they're living as as if they do not have the benefit of Calvary availing for them and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. Earnestly, do you pray earnestly at all? Or are you watching your time while you are praying? I spent two minutes now, I spent five minutes now. Lord, that's enough time to give to you. I have other important things to do more than talking to you more than communicating with you more than interceding for souls and more than pleading before the altar of the lord and more than in agony importunity praying unto you you pray like that that your prayer does not even move you if your prayer cannot move you how can your prayer move god but we're told of jesus christ that he was in a great sweat of blood as it were, he was uh, having drops of blood falling down onto the ground. And what prayer was he praying? Let's come back to verse 41. In verse 41, it tells us the prayer that Jesus prayed, and he was withdrawn from them about his toes cast, and he kneeled down and prayed. In verse 42, he said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Have you ever prayed like that? Not my will, thy will be done. Have you ever thought like that? This is what will please the flesh. This is what will be com comfortable for me. And this is what will make me live and remain, abide in my comfort zone this one will not disrupt my peace of mind but lord not as i will but thine be done the time of going out for evangelism is not convenient for me but not my will thine be done the activities of the ministry they are not easy for me but not my will but thine be done this is hard this is tough climbing the mountain of ministry but not my will thine be done when you come across difficulties challenges in the calling in the commission in your consecration in your commitment to the lord and then the flesh is about to say won't you rest won't you give up won't you allow other people to now pick up the baton and be running and don't you think you ought to go and sleep now 
Don't you think to beat the hold up and to beat this and to beat that, you ought to check out now and run out now. Do you ever pray when things are tough and difficult for you or wants to touch that thing and it's hot? And once you try to climb and your heart is palpitating as if you're going to give up. Or once you confront a sinner and he speaks to you directly to your face and rejects what you are saying. Or once you are talking to a young person and the young person does not know that you are as old as his father or, or his mom. And speaks to you in a particular way. You say, uh, this is enough. I cannot bear this alone. Do you ever pray and do you ever kneel self to the cross and say nevertheless not my will but thine be done. That's the kind of prayer of the believer that conforms with that of the bishop. Look at Romans chapter 10 verse 1. In Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul, why didn't you pray that all these persecutions you have will come to an end? They stoned you that other time. Why don't you pray that will not happen again? Oh God, don't let this happen again. Why don't you pray, Paul, they beat you the other time. Lord, don't let this happen again. Paul, why don't you pray there was shipwreck that time? There will be no shipwreck anymore. Why don't you pray, Paul? You were betrayed in the hands of false brethren. Why don't you pray and really pray that no false brother, no false sister will come to your side again? He said, All that is not important. Self is dead. Not what I want. Not what I will. My prayer for Israel, my prayer for the whole nation is that they might be saved. That's the kind of prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. That should be our prayer. And we should pray for sinners around. It is only then our prayer will be like that of the Bishop of our soul. Look at number three now. Number three is the pursuit of the believer like that of the bishop, our bishop, the Lord Jesus Christ, the shepherd and the bishop of our soul, the pursuit of the believer like that of the bishop. What's his pursuit? If Jesus Christ on earth today, what would be his pursuit? If Jesus Christ were in your community, if Jesus Christ were to live physically in your district, if Jesus Christ were to be in your local government, if Jesus Christ were to be in your region, in your state, in the nation, if Jesus Christ were to live where you live, among the people you live, what will be his pursuit today? And look at Luke chapter 19 verse 10. In Luke chapter 19 verse Luke chapter 19 verse 10 for the son of man is come the son of man is come is come on earth is come to this world is come to Nazareth is come to Capernaum is come to Jerusalem is come to this village is come to this city is come anywhere he went that was why he went there and you must be able to say the same thing this must be your pursuit you must say this child of god this believer in christ this believer in the gospel is come to this place is come to this territory is come to this community the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost that was his pursuit and you as a believer following after the steps of our bishop 
that must be your own pursuit as well in Mark chapter 1 verse 37 Mark chapter 1 verse 37 and when they had found him they say they said unto him all men seek for thee look at verse 38 in verse 38 and he said unto them let us go into the next towns the pursuit of our bishop let us go into the next towns let us go into the next city let us go into the next local government let us go into the next community that I may preach there also I've done it here I need to go and do it in that other place also but therefore came I forth but therefore came I forth verse 39 and he preached in the synagogues throughout all Galilee he preached in the synagogues he preached in their sanctuaries he preached in the local churches he preached in all those communities throughout all Galilee and he cast out devils it tells us in uh, Acts chapter 8 verse 4 Acts chapter 8 verse 4 therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word they did it here they did it there they did it in the next village in the next town in the next city in the next community in the next household they went everywhere preaching the word and that's what the Lord is calling us to today to have the same passion as that of our bishop the same prayer as that of our bishop and the same pursuit as that of our bishop and I pray the grace in Christ the strength from Christ the passion from Christ the zeal the fire the fervency the focus coming out of Christ will come into every one of us in Jesus name Amen. it will increase our love for him Amen. our love for souls and our passion for the work of the Lord the great commission will become our meat our food our will and all other wheels and all other passions and all other pursuits will be lessened in our lives and we'll move on and go on preaching and persuading and praying and bringing people into the kingdom of God in Jesus name Amen. the grace of God multiply in your life Amen. the passion of the Lord infuse you and energize you and fire you up in Jesus name Amen. The faithfulness of the Lord abides in your life and the fruitfulness that we ought to see in the kingdom of God abides in your ministry in Jesus name. Amen. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer that the Lord will take these words and effect them in every one of our lives. Please open your mouth to the Lord and pray unto the Lord tell the Lord bring everything you have heard unto the Lord understand as a believer he wants you to have the character of the bishop he wants you to have the marks of the bishop he wants you to have the behavior of the bishop why don't you open your mouth and pray for the grace of God God I need your grace 
tell him, tell him, he wants to hear you pray. A believer praying like a bishop prayed, like a savior prayed with all your heart. Pray with importunity. Are you blameless? Without blemish? Let him purge. Let him purify. Let him take every stain away from your life. That as a real believer, having the great work of grace done in your life, every blame, every blemish, he'll take away. A man of one wife, a woman of one husband. You know what that means? Loving him like you lo love no other man, loving her like you love no other woman. Vigilant, watchful, to watch over your life, watch over your behavior, you're sober, you don't give any excuse for frivolity, no excuse for carelessness, sober, of good behavior. As your behavior in the private, godly behavior, gracious behavior, guided behavior, as your behavior, a man to women, a woman to men. What are those actions? Can your behavioral actions see the light of day of good behavior hospitable hospitable your life is inviting your life does not repel people the life of the believer Will not repel people, drive away people, discourage people, tread down on people, trample upon people, make people fearful, frightened. You are friendly. Walk on that. If you are not friendly, walk on that. If you are not of good behavior, if you are not hospitable, walk on that. If you are selfish, you are stingy, walk on that. That your life will be giving and giving and giving. You are apt to teach. You are not afraid to teach, you are apt to teach. You don't withdraw from teaching, you are apt to teach. You enjoy teaching. You give yourself to study and teaching. You are not giving to wine. And nothing intoxicates you like wine. Your possession does not intoxicate you like wine. Money does not intoxicate you like wine 
They're not striker. They're not violent. Your life, your disposition does not give the message you want people to fear you, to be frightened of you because they are afraid you might strike them or smite them with your tongue. You don't have acid on your tongue. Your tongue does not carry a sword. And you are not greedy or filthy looker. You are not greedy, running after what others are running after. He has it, I must have it. You are not watching your bank account increase, increase, increase. While you are getting leaner and leaner and leaner spiritually. You love souls more than money. You love God more than money. You love ministry. You love service more than money. You are patient. You are patient for God. You are prayed something to happen. It's about to happen. It has not happened. You are patient with God. You are patient with the church. Expect the church to do this, the church to do that. Be patient. Patience is the character, the behavior, the aptitude, the attitude of the true believer. You are not a brawler, loud complainer, scattering the fellowship. You keep your house, watch over yourself. The best way to keep your home is to keep yourself. Your example will speak louder than your admonition. Leave it out for the members of the family to see. What you live out, the grace of the believer, the goodness in a believer, the character of the believer, leave it out for the family to see. And the members of the family will find it easy to live after the example. Remember, nothing to be proud about. You're gifted, nothing to be proud about. You're strong, nothing to be proud about. You are an achiever, nothing to be proud about. Humble yourself. In the sight of the Lord. He has called us to learn and to live for the Savior. Learn of Him and live for the Savior. It's gentle, learn that of Him. He is meek, learn that of him. He is lowly, learn that of him. 
he is loving than that of him is sacrificial than that of him lead the lost to the savior and to salvation every day everywhere lead sinners to repentance lead them to faith in Christ lead them to assurance of salvation and lead them to the victorious life of a real saved soul remember he calls you to leave all of self and to lose all of self. None of self, but all of thee. I'll not compete with my Savior none of self all of thee i will not seek my own honor i'll not seek my own glory i'll not seek my own exaltation i will not seek my own promotion seek my own self-esteem none of self nothing for self all for thee pray that God will grant you the passion of Christ the zeal of Christ the fervency of Christ, the earnestness of Christ. Christ was not dull, passive, lukewarm, disinterested, uninterested. Christ was not neutral. The zealous for the Lord in action the zealous for the Lord the seeking for souls the zealous for the Lord in the work of the kingdom the zealous for the Lord in the household of faith, be zealous for the Lord. The zeal of the ministry has eaten me up. The zeal in his service has eaten me up. Let your prayer be the bishop's prayer. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Stop fighting for your will. Stop asking for your will. Stop demanding for your will. Stop feeding on your will. Stop projecting your will. Let the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. 
nevertheless not my will but thine be done and have the pursuit of our bishop the pursuit of the shepherd and the bishop of our souls in Jesus name we pray Amen. father we thank you today we bless your name because according to your will according to your desire you have revealed unto us what you expect of every child of yours what you expect of every believer what you expect of every son and daughter of yours what you expect of every servant of god every worker in the vineyard of the lord lord we know it demands your grace without you we can do nothing without you we cannot be all we ought to be without you we'll be human without you we'll be fleshly without you we'll be carnal without you we'll be graceless without you we'll be godless but lord in christ in you was salvation and with the great work of grace done in our hearts all you intend all you demand all you desire all you appreciate can be planted in every one of our lives Amen. and lord in all humility and in all faith without wavering and without doubting we're asking O oh lord perfect your work of grace in every heart in jesus name Amen. No one can come to you in the real sense and be the same again. No one can touch you and be the same as before. No one can receive of the grace from your heart and remain as superficial and shallow, as carnal, as fleshly, as human as before we come to you and we touch you now and we want you to transform every one of us by your grace by your power do it lord in jesus name Amen. lord jesus you have invited us and you have chosen us and you want us to bear fruit we will not be fruitless Amen. we will not be faithless Amen. we will not be fleshly Amen. Lord, we are asking that the qualities in Christ and the qualities of Christ you implant in our hearts in Jesus' name. We come to learn of you. And we're praying, oh Lord, every time we we'll see you, the people around us will see more of Christ in us in Jesus' name. The righteousness of Christ in us the goodness of Christ in us the meekness of Christ in us the gentleness of Christ in us the lowliness of Christ in us the holiness of Christ in us and the goodness of Christ who went about doing good and healing all who are pressed of the devil the goodness of Christ in us in Jesus name the tirelessness of Christ, the disposition of Christ, the might of Christ that wants to go on and on and on serving you without looking back. Grant it to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, we will live for you. And we pray, O oh Lord, we also will leave everything behind, everything of our selfish nature everything of our carnal nature everything of our natural self we leave everything and lose everything for the kingdom of god in jesus name 
all the past lifestyle of this is me and this is mine and this is my way and this is what I want and I will have my way oh Lord strike all that out and wash all that out and cleanse all that out of all our lives in Jesus name this very day we leave self here we dump self here and Lord we throw away self we dig the earth and bury self in Jesus name from now on none of self but all of thee from now on thou must increase and we must keep on decreasing and decreasing and decreasing until there is none of force to be seen to be projected in Jesus name Lord in reality give us your passion in reality give us the prayer that you prayed infuse impute in part that prayer into our heart that we will pray for others like you prayed for others in Jesus name and Lord the grace to pursue without fainting the grace to pursue without getting tired the grace to pursue without getting weary the grace to pursue without minding the cost and the grace to pursue until we have done and we have gone and we have accomplished everything your day for each of us will accomplish that grace to pursue that strength to pursue that tirelessness to pursue give unto every one of us in Jesus name do something definite in every heart in every life that Lord the change will be visible and the change will be well known to all around us in Jesus name every brother every sister that are partaking of the bread of life today together with us we pray none of us will ever remain the same again help us grow up to the fullness of the measure of the stature of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ affirm and confirm it Lord in every life I thank you because we know you have answered in Jesus mighty name we pray